billionaire Warren Buffett and his right-hand man, Charlie Munger, are warning us that a $1.4 trillion debt-fueled tsunami is brewing in the real estate sector. $1.4 trillion debt-fueled tsunami has already started to hit the real estate market. So what does this mean for us and for all the people who own homes and properties across the country and how does this affect our economy? Let's watch and find out. Billionaire investor Warren Buffett is warning about a major storm that is about to strike the U.S. real estate market. This $1.4 trillion debt-fueled tsunami has already started to hit the real estate market as we speak. Anything to do with debt and real estate, I guarantee has implications around the interest rates. Charlie Munger has warned of a brewing storm in the U.S. commercial property market with American banks full of what he said were bad loans as property prices fall. Please allow elaborate on what's going on in commercial estate, how bad will the losses be, and what sectors or geographies look particularly bad. So the interesting thing is they're talking about commercial here, whereas most people are only worried about residential real estate. So residential real estate is typically a one to four unit property, single family home, duplex, triplex, or fourplex. And the commercial real estate is anything above that. So a fiveplex unit, sixplex, all the way up to your hundred, multi hundred unit apartment complexes, or you even have like warehouses, you have strip malls, etc. Now the real big difference is how loans are delivered for these different types of properties. So for one to four unit properties, these are typically done on fixed loans. You have 30 year loans fixed for 30 years, and you have to worry about rising interest rates or loan terms coming due and people needing to get their money back ASAP. Whereas with commercial loans, they typically have a five year term, which means that even though you're paying it off as if it would be paid off in 25 years, you only have five years before you have to refinance and get the loan again. Well, Berkshire's never been very important, very active in commercial real estate. It works better for taxable investors than it does for corporations tax the way Berkshire is. So I don't anticipate huge effects on Berkshire. I don't know. Does Berkshire Hathaway own any commercial real estate? I think they're more known for just buying companies in general and letting them operate more efficiently. But I do think that the hollowing out of the downtowns in the United States and elsewhere in the world is going to be quite significant and quite unpleasant. I think the country will get through it all right, but uh, as they say, it will, awfully, it will often involve a different set of owners. And that's how it works. The real estate is real. So just because the owner of this real estate goes bankrupt doesn't mean they tear the building down. It just goes into foreclosure and then someone else picks up for cheap. The buildings don't go away, but... And the owners do. Over the last 15 years, the U.S. real estate market has been fueled by massive amounts of cheap debt. Take a look at this chart of the U.S. federal funds effective rate, a proxy for interest rates in the economy. This is the Fed funds rate. So this is like how banks lend money to each other. And, you know, obviously if banks are lending money to each other at such a low rate, then the mortgage must be higher than this rate. And as you can see now, the Fed funds rate is almost at 5%. So it doesn't make sense to do a mortgage to some random consumer for under 5% if I can get that same amount from a bank who's more secured. We can see here that interest rates spent the better part of the last 15 years at 0%. These low interest rates incentivize the use of massive amounts of debt and push real estate values to sky high levels. This is also called quantitative easing, which helped stock prices increase a lot since 2010. And I was very fortunate in that I graduated in 2012, 2013. So I had the ability to just ride this wave where stocks were you know, getting pumped and boosted while I was starting my career and investing. Imagine someone is buying an office building in your hometown. For a nice round number, let's say the cost of this building is $1 million. The buyer of this building likely doesn't have an extra million dollars of cash sitting in his bank account to purchase this building outright. Likely, what this buyer is going to do is go to a bank to get a loan to fund the majority of the purchase price. In this example, our buyer here is contributing $350,000 of the purchase in the form of what is referred to as equity. Think of this as just a fancy word for down payment like when someone is purchasing a house. And one interesting thing to note is actually commercial real estate is more conservative than residential real estate. So with an owner-occupied property, I can get into a property with as much as 0% down, you know, with a VA loan, USDA loan, etc. Our buyer then goes goes to a small local bank to get a loan for the remaining $650,000. How profitable this purchase is for the buyer is dependent on many things, but one of the most important is the interest rate on the loan. In this example, let's say our buyer got an interest only loan at 5%. This means that each year, our buyer is responsible for paying 5% of the total loan amount in interest payments to the bank. Think of this as the equivalent of a mortgage payment for a homeowner. Typically, I haven't seen many commercial loans be interest only have 
have some principal portion to it. So the way they explain it is your loan is gonna have a term length, which is how long the loan is gonna be active for before you have to refinance or basically pay the lender off. But there's also something called amortization rate. So if your amortization is for 25 years, then it's as if you are paying the loan off in 25 years with these set monthly payments. One important metric banks look at when evaluating whether to lend on a property like this is called a debt service coverage ratio or DSCR for short. So the interesting thing about DSCR is that they actually do this for residential real estate as well. So I made a video about this a couple of months ago about DSCR loans where they base a loan and the qualifications of it on the ability for that property to generate rents instead of on the individual and their income from their full-time job. Think of this as a measure of how much breathing room a property has to be able to make its debt payment in the event things take a turn for the worse. And again, this makes a lot of sense for commercial real estate because when you're buying a $100 million apartment complex, no one individual is really gonna have the amount of income from their full-time job to sustain the payments of this building. So they look at how the building itself can operate as an income producing product. This metric is calculated by taking the income the property generates, so in our case, the $60,000, and dividing that by the annual debt payment. In this example, the $32,500, which leaves us with a DSCR of 1.85 times. As a general rule of thumb, banks like to see a DSCR of greater than 1.2 times. And again, these numbers are very unrealistic because first of all, almost no one is getting an interest only loan at 5% even back a few years ago. So typically your yearly debt payment includes your principal payment and it's gonna be higher than that. Let's see what happens when interest rates rise. In the US, when someone buys a house to live in, the vast majority of time that purchase is funded with a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And some people were trying to get adjustable rate mortgages because they are slightly lower than the fixed rate ones. So for example, if there was a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 3%, you can get an adjustable rate for maybe 2.75% or 2.85%. Now they thought, okay, I'm saving a couple hundred dollars a month here, but in a few years, their rate will adjust and they're gonna be far past the initial 3%. So I always recommend people get a fixed rate mortgage. And then if something happens and rates go lower, you can always refinance and get a lower rate. But if rates go higher, then that's cool. Now you're just sitting on all these loans with very low interest rates. Buyers of commercial properties, like the office building in our example here, are not so fortunate. Interest rates on commercial loans are not fixed for the duration of the loan. Instead, the loan essentially comes due every three to five years and the rate resets to whatever the current interest rate is for that type of loan. And when it comes due, the bank is under no obligation to extend you or even give you another loan. So, I mean, if the bank needs their money, they're gonna ask their money back and ask for you to pay them back by getting another loan from another lender or to sell the property and then pay them back that way. Let's take things one step further and bump that interest rate up to 9%. The debt payment on this building skyrockets to $58,500. The $60,000 of income is barely enough to cover the debt payment. However, keep in mind this is an office building. The rise of remote work has significantly decreased the demand for office space. I've even heard of Facebook spending several hundred million dollars in order to get out of their lease in a building in London that they never used because of COVID. Let's say the income of this property falls from $60,000 down to $40,000. As tenants don't renew their leases and the amount of empty office space in the building increases. The owner of this building is in big trouble now. The income the property generates is not enough to cover the debt payment. As a result, this property is likely headed to foreclosure. The fact that these loans take no recourse, which means that as long as they do everything correctly, there's no fraud involved, they can just walk away and have no impact on their personal credit or their personal like liabilities. The bank can't just gum and sue them for walking away from this property. The bank is going to take possession of this building and sell it to a different owner, likely for a fraction of what the previous buyer paid. And this is where you savvy real estate investors need to come in and start learning how to buy commercial real estate. Most people like to buy with non-recourse in, in, yeah. in real estate. And and uh, one time I asked Charlie, I, there was some real estate guy we were talking to him, and you know, how do they decide how much they can, a building like this is worth? And it's the answer is it's whatever they can borrow without signing their name. And if you look at that real estate generally, you'll understand what the phenomena that's happening if you, if you remind yourself that that's the attitude of most people that have become big in the, in, in the real estate business. And and, uh, and it does mean then that the lenders are the ones that get the property. And of course, they don't want the property usually. So then the real estate operator comes on negotiating with them and, and the, the banks tend to, you know, extend and pretend and 
there's all kinds of activities that arrive out of out of uh, commercial real estate development, which occurs on a big big scale. All has consequences, and and I think we're we're about well, we are starting to see the consequences of people who could borrow at two and a half percent find out it doesn't work at current rates, and they hand it back to somebody that gave them all the money they needed to build it. When I started looking into commercial real estate, this was around 2018, and rates were at three four percent, and a lot of deals even back then were kind of borderline. Like maybe they work, maybe they won't. So now it's been about five years later, a lot of people who bought real estate in 2018 who haven't sold yet are going to be in a lot of trouble because they're holding on to these properties, the rates are adjusting on them, and the numbers just don't work anymore. Okay, so from this, you might be thinking, why should the banks allow people to have non-recourse loans on these commercial loans? And the answer is because these properties, again, are just so big that it doesn't make sense for just one sponsor to be liable for the whole thing if everything comes crashing down. Typically, when they buy these big buildings, it's going to be a company or a syndication where they're raising money from all kinds of people. So when it comes time to you know give up the keys, who do they go after? The one individual that raised all the money? They probably won't work out because this person probably doesn't even have enough money to support all that stuff. And if that was the case, then maybe no individual want to buy commercial real estate in the first place because the risks are just too high if things go sour. And again, the thing with most real estate investors on the commercial space, they make some money when they get the property and they get an acquisition fee, but really the bulk of their money is made when they sell the property. When you borrow money to buy a house to live in, you have to sign what is known as a personal guarantee. In short, what this means is that you are on the hook to pay back the bank regardless of what happens to the house. So for example, if you have a $400,000 mortgage and the value of the house falls to $300,000, you are on the hook for the difference. You can't just give the bank the keys and say, good luck. At this point, you need to negotiate with the bank and ask them for permission to sell it short. And of course, if you just don't make your payments, then they can foreclose on your house and take the value of your property. But if you're a more reasonable person, you would just understand that, hey, things happen, continue making your payments, and hopefully the value increases far beyond what you initially bought it for. Let's say a large real estate investment firm buys a piece of real estate for $50 million. The real estate investment firm contributes $10 million and borrows the other $40 million needed to purchase the property from a bank in the form of non-recourse debt. A few years pass by, and since this is a commercial real estate loan, it is time for the interest rate to reset. Unfortunately, this property was purchased at the peak of the market when interest rates were low and real estate values were sky high. When it comes time for the loan to reset, the property is now only worth $30 million. Since this is a non-recourse loan, the owner of the property can toss the keys back to the bank and walk away. Yes, the large real estate investment firm loses the $10 million they put in to buy the property. Interestingly enough, I don't think the value of the property would actually change because typically with commercial real estate, the value of the property is the net operating income divided by the cap rate. Now, generally speaking, the cap rate won't really move in one big location. And again, the net operating income is determined by the cash flow received minus all the regular expenses. So all this being equal, the net operating income won't change because of the interest rate and the cap rate also won't change because of the interest rate. So therefore, your value should stay the same. Now that being said, your next borrower is probably gonna need to get a loan to buy your property in the first place. And so that's where there's gonna be some contention. The buyer can't buy your property at the current value and the current cap rate because they can't get a loan for that rate. Given that this loan is non-recourse, the bank has no option but to just eat the loss. This isn't just a hypothetical example. There is an estimated $1.4 trillion worth of these loans coming due over the next 12 to 24 months. The interesting thing is they say that the bank takes all the loss, but I'm not sure this is entirely true. You know, again, there's gonna be no personal recourse, so they can't go after my own assets. But if I do own a company and have multiple loans out there or have assets in the company, maybe they can go after the individual companies. But what I assume they do is they open a company to buy one particular asset, and then if something goes sour, they just close the company down and the bank can't do anything to the individual investors. Starwood, one of the largest real estate investment firms in the world, recently defaulted on a $212 million loan on an office building in the city of Atlanta. This office building was once a premier piece of real estate in a major, rapidly growing U.S. city. Currently, the office building is only 60% full, down from 90% when the loan was originally made back in 2018. Property had lost so much value that Starwood didn't even try to negotiate a deal with the lender to save it. Instead, Starwood, in effect, just handed the lender the keys to the building and walked away. This 
may be one of the first of these stories, but I can guarantee there will be many more to come. The impacts of these defaults will likely be long-lasting and spread far beyond just the commercial real estate market. You see, the American banking industry is dominated by large banks. As this table shows, the six largest U.S. banks have combined assets of a whopping $14 trillion. So these large banks typically operate in the traditional mortgage space. So they're doing loans for, you know, you and I when we buy our primary home. But the ones who are doing loans for these commercial buildings are the small banks. And these small banks are also giving these small business loans to, you know, mom and pop shops out there, small restaurants, etc. So if these small banks are the ones taking the hit and then they fold, then there's gonna be less money for these other companies, these all small mom and pop shops. That's probably the downfall of all this. It will be the small banks who have made the majority of commercial real estate loans that will be left holding the bag. Now, this is not a call to rush and pull your money out of your account if you bank with one of these small banks. The majority of these banks will be able to withstand these losses. Additionally, any banks that do fail will see depositors covered by FDIC insurance. There are two famous banks that went under this past year, and I think for the most part, most people aren't too worried because they are covered by the FDIC insurance. So $250,000 of their money is safe. The small banks that will take losses from lending to commercial real estate will now likely have to pull back dramatically from lending in general. This will greatly negatively impact small and medium-sized businesses access to credit. Without access to this capital, it will be much more difficult for these businesses to expand and grow. And this will result in less hiring and less spending, which ultimately negatively impacts economic growth. Only time will tell how this all plays out in the real estate market. However, one thing is for certain. As Buffett's business partner, Charlie Munger said earlier in this video, there's going to be a lot of pain. The question is, who will ultimately be the one to bear it? So that was a very interesting take on the health of the real estate market. Again, this doesn't really apply to the residential space, but for these multi-trillion dollar real estate assets out there, it could greatly impact our economy, right? We already have office buildings that are basically vacant because people aren't going back to work. With these rising interest rates, people who own these buildings may not be able to continue paying for them and may have to give up the keys. And when that happens, the banks are the ones that are gonna be impacted the most. And when banks are impacted, they can't give out loans to small business owners. So you're gonna see less mom and pop stores out there. And when you have less businesses, then you have less jobs. When you have less jobs, then everything just goes into a cycle of downturn and people stop paying and you have recessions, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna have to see how this all works out. I think 2024 will be a very interesting year. If you guys enjoy videos like this one, let me know down below if there are any specific real estate investing videos that you want me to check out and give my comments on on this channel. And if you're interested in learning how DSCR loans work for residential real estate, then check out this video over here. Thanks for watching guys. I appreciate you and I'll see you next time. Take care.